Hello everybody. Okay, so if we talk about the future of photography, it can be quite an intimidating thought. You know, sort of cast your mind back to maybe 10, 15, even 20 years ago. Think of where the cameras were then and where they are now. So I've got Mike here with me and we're going to be discussing um, some of the changes that's happening in uh, currently in the photography world and also maybe what the future might hold. Mike, how's it going? Hey, good. Hello everyone. How's it John? Good. Uh, thanks for having me on your channel. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So let's go first of all. Um, I've got with me, I've got a, a 1DX2, which is not that old of a camera. I think it's probably about five, six years old now. Um, and this was like the top of the range camera during that time. Still very good camera. But I think, um, Mike, you, you've got a Olympus there. I think one of the biggest changes um, that has happened over like at least the sort of last four or three, four years has been the, the size and, and the weight of these cameras. Exactly, yeah. So and that's the biggest reason for my change was to downsize. I mean, the amount of travel that must, I do, you hire all the guys in office, um, you start feeling it in your back, uh, carrying these big, chunky lenses, heavy camera bodies. So the main reason, or well, there's two main reasons why I downsized, is because of the size factor. I mean, if you look at this... Yeah, I'll put this maybe next to it. Mm. Cool, yeah, uh, the body itself. show you the back. So the body's not too too different. So 1DX and then my Olympus setup over here. So this is the OMD EM1X that I have. There we go, Johan. Sure. And it's considered their pro body, so it's got a built-in battery grip, but still a hell of a lot lighter than that 1DX is. So that saves my back when I travel, carrying smaller gear, lighter gear, um, but even though there isn't much a size reduction on this, um, it still is a lot lighter than most of your DSLRs, and the technology in it is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, yeah and I think what uh, what Olympus has done well um, is is the lenses. Yeah. Right? Like one of the things that put me off originally with the mirrorless stuff, especially with the cameras, was I thought the cameras were, were very small. And then if you have a bigger lens attached to it, it almost feels like there's, there's not, not that balance that you mm -hmm. kind of want. Um, so I like that you've, you've got a battery grip on there, so obviously then if you shoot in portrait orientation, you've, uh, you've still got your, your shutter button there. But um, let's have a look at the, the difference in lenses, because I think that's, that's where the, um, the real difference lies. I'm going to pass this one to you. You <laughs> <laughs> see, I haven't had a big lens like this in my hands for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, what's this, a 400? It's a fixed 400, yeah. So, massive fixed 400, you can literally wear it on your head. It's massive. Comparing it to what is Olympus's Pro Lens 40 to 150, um, you can see that size difference. Let me just change this around without dropping anything. But look at that size difference. And essentially, these two lenses will pretty much give you the same focal length. Um, at 40 to 150, because Olympus is micro four thirds, you're getting a two times crop factor. So therefore, seeing that it's a 150 millimeter lens, I'm in, in turn getting 300 millimeters. But just look at how compact that is. When I close up the lens hood, when I pack this into a bag, it takes up little to no space in it, which to me has been a massive, massive game changer. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it makes a it makes a huge difference. Um, Secondly, let's talk about the autofocus system. So, uh, the autofocus systems and the DSLR is pretty stock standard. It's not much has changed sort of over the last um, four or five years from a DSLR point of view. But now with the uh, mirrorless stuff, it's actually frightening the, the autofocus capabilities that it, that it has. You know, things like eye tracking. Um, Mike, you've now recently moved over to that. Talk me through how you've experienced the eye tracking, especially you know, with you photographing wildlife mainly, how has that um, helped you, especially with birds, how has that assisted you in getting the right images? Yeah, so the, the autofocus on these mirrorless cameras are absolutely insane. I think that's where they've really won um, and taken the game of photography to an absolute next level. And I, the first time I used this gear was in the Masai Mara, and then shortly after in the Pantanal. And 
I was still kind of getting used to it. Coming from a, a Canon system onto an Olympus system was quite a, a thing to get used yeah. to. Um, but once you get into the swing of things, it's, I mean, a camera is a camera. Hmm. May I shoot now Olympus? If a Sony shooter comes to me, I can still assist them and help them through everything. Um, the menu system is just slightly different. And yeah. I think of all menu systems, I think Olympus has got the most complex. So it took me a while to, to figure out exactly how to use this autofocus to my advantage. And once I got to the Pantanal, I really used um, the bird tracking technology in this camera when we spend time photographing the macaws in the big sinkhole, photographing the birds on the river systems um, while we were still zooming around looking for jaguars. And it is, it's actually quite frightening how this AI and the technology within the camera can pick up that that is a bird and that is not a bird. Um, it's, it's phenomenal and it, it really does in a way make photography a lot easier um, having this on your side. And I'm due for a software up, um, or firmware update on this camera which will then allow me to get autofocus detection on four-legged creatures. Some of the other Olympus cameras already have this. I know your Sony's, your Meridus, um, Canons, Nikons, they've all got this built-in technology and using some of the guest cameras over the past year and a half that have this technology in it, it is it's crazy. Yeah. It is absolutely, there's no excuse for missing the shot these days. No, exactly. <laughs> and just for those of you who, if you haven't seen it or if you've still got an old DSLR camera or if you're just getting into the photographic world now, what Mike means is in, in your menu system, you can actually set up different um, autofocus systems. So you, you can actually have like a single point focus. So if you've got something that's stationary, you've got like your little square and then you either half press your shutter or you use your back button focus press the ones that will focus on there or you've got and you can assign different buttons to this you can activate eye tracking with and then you can actually choose in a lot of the cameras whether it's an animal or if it's a person and it does a phenomenal job i think um you know apart maybe from sometimes you know leopard or cheetah sometimes wild dogs for the majority of the other animals, it picks it up and focuses straight on the eye. You don't have to move the focus point around. So, you know, that animal moves or jumps or bird takes off. It, uh, it finds that, that eye, which is I mean, incredible. And obviously, from a wildlife photography point of view, the eye is very important. Um, next thing, let's talk about the speeds in the cameras because it's gone to the stage now where we're almost shooting video. Uh, I think that this. Um, one DX when it came out, I think it was 11 frames per second. No, 11, 14. 11, or 14, I, I think it was 14. 14, 15, um, And I remember when it came out, it was like, wow, it's like incredible. But now we've got onto the murder stuff, and what's the frame rate on, on the Olympus there? So I shoot at a very low frame rate, the reason being is because taking the photographs is the easy part, yeah. sorting through the images is the tough part. Yeah. So it's all fair and well having this fast frame rate, and actually it's a blog couple of years ago about frame rate, frame rate, frame rate. People think that the faster the frame rate, the better your images. The, exactly. Trust me, the faster the frame rate, the more you're going to hate your images because you need to sort through thousands of them. Absolutely. Um, but this guy, like I said, I shoot at a very low frame rate of 12 frames a second. <laughs> <That's really laughs> crazy. But I can put this camera onto a function that they refer to as Pro Capture, whereas if I'm locked onto my subject and I'm depressing my focus button, so my, I've activated that onto the back button, so if I'm focusing on the subject, this camera is continuously writing, I can set it up to either 30 or 60 frames a second onto the memory card, but in that same second is dumping and releasing all those images, and as soon as I hit my shutter button, it saves the previous 60 that it captured, while I was focusing and then starts recording and saving and writing images to the memory card once I start capturing. So if, for example, you want to photograph a bird in flight or taking off, often we stop next to the road and there's a lilac-breasted road with a stunning bird and you want this guy up and flapping his beautiful wings and they, they're so quick, they don't give you warning. There's no excuse to miss it with this. <laughs> um, That's crazy. And I'm going to whisper it, but I have missed a few things because of... Yeah, using that. <laughs> <laughs> but getting too excited in the pants and all that, yeah, I fluked a few things. Um, but yeah, it is absolutely ridiculous the amount of images 
in one second, I mean, the second's fast. Yeah. And just to think, like that camera alone, 15, 14, 15 frames a second, yeah. that is quick. Yeah. It's a lot of photographs. Yeah, no, I mean, where do you draw the line with this, though? I mean, because, I mean, let's be honest, if you, if you need, if you feel that you need more than 14, 15 frames a second, I mean, I think you're doing something wrong. I mean, it's sometimes, yeah. maybe with a cheetah kill or in a, something like bee eaters or kingfishers, maybe. But otherwise, you don't need more than even 12, 13 frames a second. That's still a lot of photos. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're a serious birder yeah. and you're photographing birds um, and that's your, your income, if you may, then yes, the more frame rates you have, the better probably. Yeah. Um, but for hunts and action, things like that, if you take a cheetah hunting, for example, that sequence, well, depending on how far the prey is, but take some of the, the hunting scenes, cheetah hunting scenes we saw in the Serengeti. Yeah. That stretch of running takes about four or five seconds, yeah. sometimes even more, up yeah. to 10 seconds, you yeah. know, if they're covering ground and if the, the gazelle runs away. But now you've got to think of it, if you take 30 frames a second, and you've been firing away for 10 seconds. <laughs> Sorting that is going to be an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Don't ask me for help because I won't help you. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you... And then looking at the similarities in images, obviously when you're sorting and processing through Lightroom, it is so easy in a sense to go into survey mode with four similar images, choose which one's the best, dump the rest and keep moving. Yeah. But now you've got in 300 images, you're gonna have so many similarities, like it's gonna be impossible yeah, to choose the absolute best one. Yeah. So, yeah, like where do you draw the line? I have no idea, but I don't think they're ever gonna draw the line. No. And once it's drawn, someone's gonna cross it. Yeah. It's, it's not gonna, they're not gonna stop. No, exactly. <laughs> it's gonna keep happening. I think the, the, the biggest thing, I mean, I, I'm not sure if there's anything else that, um, any other big changes that you've noticed, but I think it's important to also to, um, to let people understand that you know all these changes that we've mentioned is all good and well and it's fantastic changes from a, a photographic point of view but those basic principles still remain the same you know you can have all the eye tracking and everything all the frame rates everything in the world but you know basic things like if your shutter speed is too slow or then your image is going to be um, a mess anyway so these are tools to help you achieve um, your goal and it all depends on the genre that, you, that you're photographing. But you know, this has definitely uh, sort of helped or is going to help uh, photographers going forward. But I highly encourage uh, you guys to you know, keep those basic principles and understand them, exposures, all of those things, because you know, that's something that the camera can't fix for you. I think mm -hmm. one other thing that I, I do enjoy with um, the the mirrorless cameras now is the electronic viewfinder. Yes. That you can. So what that means is, with these um, these old DSLRs, you, you look through the, the viewfinder obviously to uh, to um, your scene, and if you change your exposure, you can't see the difference. So you literally have to take a photo, have a look at um, the photo at the back of the screen, and then adjust. You know, if you want to go darker or lighter. Whereas with the new um, electronic viewfinders. You can actually see those changes being made in the camera, which I think is amazing. It definitely does help and it saves time. Yeah. Because I often, when I used to shoot DSLR, like you say, you have to take that shot, check your exposure, keep going. Yeah. You might have to make minor changes. And you often still see, now with guests and, and on safaris with us these days, and I myself shooting mirrorless, um, you save a lot of time. And I mean, in life in general, time is your enemy especially when it comes to wildlife photography, then it's really your enemy. Yeah. Because if you waste four seconds trying to figure something out, looking at your camera and you look up, that line is a mile away. Um, so yeah, that is, that is a massive time saving factor, which will add great value to your photography because you say you're seeing the exposure in camera, so you know what you're gonna receive, um, get as soon mm. as you hit that shutter. Sure. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a big, big game changer. But I think to, Double back on what Johan said is comes down to the genre of photography and, and if you're in the market looking for cameras, I urge you to do your homework because a mirrorless system might not be for you right now. Um, come, and another question. It does come at a price. Eh? 
That's what, yeah. And I was, I'm going to get to that now. And I mean, you need to ask yourself, what are you shooting for? I mean, if you, an up and coming Nacho photographer, and you're going to print and make cash using your photographs, then yes, the, the latest and greatest might be for you. But you need to understand if you are new to photography, buying the latest and greatest isn't necessarily going to get you to the next level. I mean, we see so many people say first safari and they bought the best gear and they have no idea on how to use it. Obviously that's what we, we then fill in, we assist, we help, and we teach them the right ways. But just know when you are hunting for cameras, make sure that you know what you're going to be shooting, know what you're shooting for, and there's always something I say, each to your own budget, because like you said, it comes at a price. The mirrorless stuff and the later technology, newest technology is extremely expensive, but, and that's one of the, so I, I mentioned, Johan, the reasons why I downscaled is because of the size. I mean, carrying two cameras about that size in a backpack, I'm loving it. Yeah. It's so amazing. But then also the, the price label attached to your Canon, Sony, Nikon mirrorless systems, all their new technology, to me is something my mind can't comprehend. No. And for what I'm doing and what I'm shooting for, it, I don't see, I can't justify paying that ridiculous amount of money for a camera setup, whereas this is doing a perfectly good job. It's more comfortable to travel. It's easier to shoot in and amongst guests because it's much more compact. So I don't swing this massive lens in front of people. Um, so there's many more, so I ask myself these questions and there's many more pros to not only saving money, but also being more respectful to guests on safari, yep. and traveling lighter. And I'm not printing and selling my images. That's not where my money lies. Sure. And so this setup is perfectly fine for me. So ask those questions. They're very important before you go out and buy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think that pretty much, I don't know if you've got anything else, any other major differences that you would... Um, yeah, it's, you think? there's a lot of, there's many differences. And I think if we, if we really dig into it and compare each camera and um, bit of technology in each, it'll be, this will be here for hours, for days. Right. Yeah. By that point, the people would be... <laughs> no longer interested in photography at all. No. <laughs> so there's sure. a lot, but um, yeah, if you can afford it, I'd say it's a good, good lead to take. Yeah. So that's um, that's the differences between um, DSLRs and mirrorless stuff. Another thing that's become quite popular recently is the use of drones. Now, obviously, in, in national parks and private game reserves that we often visit, those drones are not allowed. But I think it, it has. You know, become a quite a big thing for for lodges and for um, for promo videos. Uh, Mike, I don't know what what your take is on on drones. What do you where do you stand with with that from a you know creativity and, and photographic view? Well, look, there is there is two sides to it because it, it is very creative. Yeah. Um, and the perspective it can provide is insane, and you can do it at a much cheaper cost. I mean, in the past to get footage like that. You needed to get a helicopter in, and then stabilizing those cameras on a helicopter can be a nightmare. And um, so it was a, an extremely expensive exercise to achieve and to get footage um, like drones can easily provide for us today. Yeah. Um, so I see it being very impactful and very, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, yeah, impactful and it's, it's content that can gain legs quickly because yeah. it's slightly different. It is becoming a bit saturated now. Yeah. Um, but then on the ethical side of things, I've they are a bit of a pest. Yes. I mean, if you, like we always chat about how incredible it'll be to have drones during a river crossing. Oh, man. You know, you, the footage you can get will be ridiculous. No. And which, it's just not possible because if you think of how many tourists go and visit the Mara and watch the, the migration, It'll become more of a... A sound like a sore beast. Exactly. It has it in a pest and it will be just horrific to, to mm. be in and amongst that. Um, but it, just imagine the marketing content you can create off of that. And then in turn, what that will lead to is conservation um, at the end of the day. Because when we bring guests into the Maasai Mara paying conservation fees, those costs go and those, the money that they pay go towards the conservation of this pristine area. 
Yeah. So in a way, it could work to its favor, but in the past, during lockdown, when we traveled to Sabi Sabi and Timbavati and did some social footage at Twalu, yeah. um, over the lockdown periods, we used drones. Yeah. And I personally noticed the effect it had on the animals, yeah. and how it's something they're not used to, and it's something they don't like. So you alter their behavior, which mm. from an ethical standpoint, isn't the best thing to do. Yeah because you're annoying them. Yeah. But if you think way back to when safari started, putting the first safari vehicle into the bush, no, exactly. you were pretty much unethical doing that way back then. Yeah. Because you're scaring animals, they're running away. Yeah. But today they, they sleep under your way. Yeah. So yeah, they'll get used to it, but yeah, it needs to be governed and managed very well, I'd say. Yeah. I think um, you've got a spot on. I think from a, a wildlife documentary point of view, I think it's been really cool. It's given us some and some great insights. There was the one that they did with the BBC with the wild dogs hunting. Oh, yes, hunting wallabies. Yeah, hunting Jeez. wallabies. That's so it, it definitely, you know, for the guys creating wildlife documentaries, um, it has it has given us a, a nice perspective. But like you said, I think it just has to be done ethically and responsibly. And I'm quite happy not to have it um, become available to every single tourist that, that goes to these parks. Um, what about, let's talk about anti-poaching, use it for, for anti-poaching purposes. I know there's been a lot of talks on it, and um, it's obviously not, the drones we're talking here from an anti-poaching point of view is not the little small DJI little DJI or, with 45 minute battery life. And they can do a backflip with a no, push of a button. Yeah, no, no. It's definitely, <laughs> um, it's, it's bigger things. So that, that's something that interests me quite a bit. Yeah, and like you said, that's a, a couple of levels up in terms of technology, capabilities of those drones, the distances they can fly, yeah. the cameras they can carry, and the price tag that comes along yes. with it. Yeah. And it's, it's actually very sad to, not, to sit here and say, you know, in order to save a few rhinos, they're going to have to go pay a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. for a drone yeah. just to save a rhino's life. Yeah. It shouldn't be that way. But looking at these cameras, the infrared technology that these drones can send back literally in real time, it's not... Mm -hmm fly a drone out, come back later, see what the footage no. is. It's feeding real-time footage, infrared footage, so you can fly at night. Yeah. And, and you can even plot the, the map where it flies. You it, don't even need someone to, to fly it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. There's geo-plotting happening in Iceland now. One of the guides, Chris, who, who's guided a few of our tours, he does that as like a part-time gig. Yeah. And he takes his drone out and plots um, Crazy. The, 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 um, the landscapes, if you know. Yeah. Um, and they use this research and it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And yeah, you can literally map out an entire area or a route that a poacher's moved or rhinos are moving. You can track and follow these rhinos, which it's, uh, yeah, it's actually quite scary, the mm. technology that's, yeah, yeah. that's in, in these drones these days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the so drones, I think it's definitely something for the future, um, a lot of fun to, to play around with, and I think it's also only going to grow from strength to strength. Mm, definitely. Now, the third one I'm going to chat about a little bit is programs. Now, I know we've both sort of played with the AI quite a bit, which is just it's blown my mind. It's, yeah. I'm sure it's done the same for you. Yeah, very much so. Um, and I'm sure people who are watching this um, may have somewhere down the line heard of AI in general, yeah. um, artificial intelligence, but a particular piece of software being um, chat GPT which it's crazy eh? yeah I, th I don't think this is our space to sit and delve into the details of they don't need promotion let's put it that way yeah they, they really <laughs> don't um, but it, that is crazy 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 technology and the the capabilities that that just that one little chat box God. the, the doors it's open to everyone really and like we're speaking about how these things are advancing. Yeah. Maybe one day we don't need these things. Yeah. You know, it's Bl link and take a photo. Exactly, exactly. I often say that I wish I could just do this and capture the moment. Maybe one day it's possible. By yeah. Like AI sunglasses and just yeah. blink twice and it takes a, a picture. No, exactly. Um, but yeah, what's your take on, like you said, it's blown your mind and it's blown, I think, everyone in this office's mind, but mm. it's. Yeah. From a f photographic p perspective, it's going to make our lives a lot easier. It is. It is. And I think like the, the, the research around it is, is super easy. You can literally, 
Um, if you guys don't know yet, it's the chat box that Mike is talking about, you can literally type in anything. You can type in, um, tell me about what shutter speed is, for example, and this thing will spit out everything for you. You can say it, make it more technical, uh, make it less technical, make it easier to understand, whatever. It's basically like chatting to a robot. Um, but a super intelligent but robot. But a super intelligent robot. <laughs> and, um, so it's, yeah, it, it's, it's mind blowing, I think. And it, it's, it's only just starting, so it's gonna. Now, this we go. literally reached that point where this Titanic starts to sink. Mm. I mean, we've hit the iceberg, everyone's heard about this. Yeah. But like I said, this is the tip of the iceberg, there's so much to come. And yeah. by the middle of this year, end of this year, yeah. uh, everything's gonna be very, very different. But I mean, speaking about how AI is gonna make our lives easier as. Um, photographers, it's already happening. Mm. You look at, like Lightroom's got AI built into it, yeah. with like subject selection, um, selecting the sky, selecting the background, whatever yeah. it may be. But I mean, you use Topaz, most of the guys in office use Topaz. Yeah. And, I mean, that is, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, but it is, that is just a massive game changer, for, for me at least. Yeah, so Topaz, um, for those of you that, uh, that haven't heard of it, it's a program that you can basically and download and then um, interlink it, it, it speaks to to Lightroom as well. So you can um, ex or edit a photo from Lightroom like you would take it into Photoshop, you can take it into Topaz. And they've got quite a few different um, programs. So the, the one that impressed me most was like a denoising tool. So for a lot of um, like the older cameras that you know, don't do uh, very well with high ISOs, you put it into Topaz uh, Denoise. I've taken photos that I've shot at 8,000 ISO and upwards, and it, it does a phenomenal job in, in cleaning it up. They also have got they've got a, a sharpening tool, which is also amazing. Um, and then there's the what's the one the uh, Giga Gigapixel Gigapixel Yeah. It's basically taking your your average file and then just making it into a massive file. And if you want to print it really big, something like that. And it's it's really not uh, not that expensive. You know, I think I, I don't know the exact price of Topaz at the moment, but it's wasn't it because it's a one-off package. That you, it's not a subscription. No, like your Lightroom would be. Yeah, it's a one-off. It's or your Adobe products. It's a one-off. I think it was seventy-four dollars. So yeah, that sounds about right. Per yeah. per thing, you can do like a package. But I'm gonna gigapixel route. Yeah. Because that's if you want to print massive billboards and so. Yeah. But they've got, they've released a new one which I'm not sure I if you've that. heard of. It's called no. Photo AI. Oh, so well. that was released recently after. Okay. So this, this entire system, Topaz, is artificial intelligence. Yeah. Because you can take into sharpening. Like an example I used, it was um, two cans in the Pantanal. Yeah. <laughs> two cans. Actually, there's a joke in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll get there later. But. I was trying to photograph this bird and this beautiful beak coming out towards me and its eyes were like soft, there was nothing there. Mm. And you know, I thought, well, I've got the software, let me give it a try. And it is so intelligent, the software is so intelligent that it, it kind of knows what this bird's eyes sh should look like if it were to be sharp. <laughs> that is ridiculous. <laughs> If I wish I'd saved all the soft leopard hunting oh, yeah. images I have because you just pull it into there. Obviously, if it's like way out and totally like, well, that image was pretty way out, but it'll work for certain images. And it'll only get better, like you said, strength to strength. Mm. But it is crazy what you can do. Yeah. Eyes that are soft and just there's no detail whatsoever, work the software into it. Literally, yeah. not even five minutes, and boom, you've got this crisp, pin sharp image. For those of you who saw that image on Instagram, is that the one of the, of the two gone? Yeah. yeah. It's eyes were like, yeah, yeah. there were no eyes that were so soft. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I love yeah. that technology. And I haven't tried the photo AI yet. Yeah. Um, but that apparently does it all in one. So it mm. does the, the sharpening, the denoising. Oh, wow. Everything in just a click wow. of a button. So it's kind of incorporated, okay. as far as I understand, I haven't used it yet, but it just incorporates it all. Click of a button, boom, your image is perfect. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, uh, another thing is even um, a program like Lightroom, if you look yeah. at how Lightroom has developed over the past 10 years, you know, not, not, like you said, with the artificial intelligence, you can literally select sky now, instead of, you know, in the past you had to use like a linear gradient or a brush, 
No, you just simply just press a button and most of the time it gets it, it gets it pretty much spot, spot, on. spot on. Yeah. So I think it's made our life a lot easier, but I think again, you know, you've got all these tools to your disposal, but it's about how you use them and not overdoing it. I think it's something that's quite important that people need to understand. Yeah, that's it. I mean, each of their own. Um, like we mentioned earlier, what genre are you going to shoot? Everyone's going to have their own style, techniques, mm -hmm. and desired outcomes at the end of the day. Yeah. And for us, we're trying to keep 95% of our work as natural and real looking as possible. Because mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to go and post this like highly processed dark scene, whatever it may be. Like you can get creative with that, and it's a good thing yeah. to push yourself towards and learn. Um, but that's not what, like if I tell you, listen, come to the Serengeti with Johan and I next year, and we then start posting of lions on copies, but it's all this dramatic and super, like everything we post is highly processed and taken to a point where it kind of seems that it's not really yeah. realistic or real. Yeah. You get there expecting to see these scenes or photograph them, but you firstly don't know how to process that way, and secondly, yeah. that's not the scene that's being presented. So yeah. again, what are you shooting for? Yeah. Um, and yeah, for us here at Wilder, we're pretty much trying to stay as natural and real as possible in terms of what we present to people. Yeah. Um, but in doing that as well, you can over-process, which now, it's very easy to take a great image and absolutely destroy it. Oh, quickly. <laughs> and, process. and when I say destroying, it's not destructive. It, you can make it look really bad, but you can just hit reset and start over. It's, yeah. it's not a destructive edit to your raw file, so yeah. don't panic. Guys, I think that is pretty much it. Um, some exciting changes in the, in the photographic world over the last uh, few years, and I think it's only going to get better and better. You know, with, um, I think to, to, um, to sum it up, you know, it, I think the times of choosing a particular brand is sort of gone out the window. I think all the brands are very close to one another. Mm -hmm. It eventually comes down to you know where you get uh, the best price or that suits your budget or which um, systems you're most comfortable with. I think that's that's what it comes down to. We'd love to hear from you guys. Let us know what you've enjoyed most. Um, any changes over the past few years that you've really enjoyed. And maybe if there's something that you would change, what would it be? I think that would be quite an interesting one. Mike, Just thank you very the, much. The response we're going to get here could be interesting. It could be very interesting. <laughs> hey, it could be some good ideas. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, thank you. It's awesome. Thank you all for your ears and your eyes. And yeah, like Jan said, we look forward to hearing from you. And we look forward to getting back to you as well. Yeah. Thanks, guys. That's it for this one. We're going to try to do more of these uh, in the future coming up. Um, so if you guys have any questions, please feel free to give us a shout or if there's any videos that you would like us to do, let us know and we'll happily do that for you. Until then, have a good one, stay safe, chat to you soon. Cheers.